I've been uh, doing this type of presentation, I think it's either my third year or second year in a row, talking about housing assessments and talking about housing inspections. Um, so it's based on uh, your guys' feedback, and I guess uh, it's a very important topic. And I think a lot of times uh, I get uh, sidebarred by talking about housing conditions or how housing is in communities, which is great. And uh, I always want to hear those stories and those uh, complications or those uh, hard situations in your community uh, when you start talking about doing housing assessments and inspections in the communities. Because there's so many things that come with it, it's not straightforward as uh, in other places. So just, I guess, introduce myself. I'm Jonathan Gregg. I've been in with the uh, Housing First Nation Conference for maybe three years, directly involved. I've been doing housing inspections since I was a summer student back in 2000, 1999, with OFN TSC. I've been uh, inspecting ever since. Uh, a lot of times I have done uh, in the municipalities also. I've done uh, on First Nations across Canada. I had an opportunity to work with ISC where we went from here to Alberta looking at different First Nations. So I've been in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Southern Ontario, just looking at uh, houses across Canada, which was uh, good to see. A lot of the housing conditions are very similar across the board, same struggles. And uh, my background is civil. I'm a civil technologist. I also am a building code qualified with the province of Ontario, and I'm WET certified. The wood energy technology, I'm also, uh, I think that's it. Anyways, let's get going. So, housing assessments. When do we want to do them? When is a good time to do them? I always find that housing assessments requests, they come in uh, at all times. And I always tell the people it's a condition assessment, it's a visual assessment. It's not, uh, you know, a promise that you're going to get renovations. It's not a promise that uh, things are going to happen. It's just a visual inspection of that date and time. Because as soon as you turn around and leave the leave the house, the whole there there could be a new hole in the wall. There could be a plumbing leak. And so many times you have to document all those things when you're doing your assessment, right? Because some of you who have done assessments and then when renovations finally come three years later, four years later, or however long later, the condition of the home changes. So I always try to reinspect if I know that renovations are going to happen. It's always good to go back and do a reinspection. Re An assessment should include a cost estimate, uh, the date, and uh, because those things are important when you're giving it to a community, a housing worker or chief and council, whoever is the end receiver of your assessment, those are the main things that they need. Uh, a lot of times uh, there's just a t time management in the community is that they don't have enough time to resource and uh, to do a cost estimate to how much it will cost to repair that home. So. Just for like a housing assessment, I don't know. It's always, it's hard to do when the homeowner always expects that there's going to be renovations. Because a lot of times we do housing assessments and there's no promise of funds. We're, at, we're applying. And so I understand if some of you have those struggles and not wanting to do housing assessment and inspection programs in your community because there's a false hope sometimes, and there's no funding, right? The reason why I put spring, summer, and fall, winter there, because during those different uh, times of the year, the house is in a different condition. So there's, any time is a good time to do an assessment. Uh, you may not see the roof if there's snow on the ground or winter conditions, but generally, I try to make uh, housing inspections, and our team at IFNA, we try to always make sure that we get that assessment done, because there may be, uh, we're going to get into it. There may be health and safety concerns that need to be identified and addressed. Um, completing an assessment, I just put a quick uh, list 
of the type of uh, tools and things that you need to do an assessment. You know, there's, there's many obvious ones. You need a flashlight, a ladder. All these are the tools that you need to do an assessment. Usually, most times, I carry a bag because you have to use a screwdriver to get into the crawl space, the attic, or you have to move, move a washer or a dryer, move a pile of laundry, you know. You see, you see a lot of things when you go into people's homes when you're doing an assessment. So some of the new things that uh, people are starting to carry is, uh, uh, what do you call them? First aid kit, uh, wipes, all these uh, heavy duty rubber gloves, because there are certain conditions now in the home where there's over, uh, uh, overcrowding, uh, there's sometimes in uh, northern communities, there's not a functioning washroom. There may be a, a slop pail in, in, the, in the replace of a toilet. Uh, there may be no plumbing. So there are homes that I've been in where there is no plumbing at all. Everything's slop bucket. There's a slop bucket under the sink, slop bucket in the bathroom, and a slop bucket to go washroom. So as inspectors, you know, and, and it's, a, it's a hard thing to do because they live there and you come up all masked up, you have a Tyvek suit on, you have work because it's policy, right? That's why I always, you know, you know, my boss is not here, so I, I, I don't wear all this stuff if these conditions are there because there's kids there, they, have, they live there. And you walk in there in, like in a hazmat suit, right? So, but it is important to have for your protection, especially the one new that uh, uh, drug overdose kit. That's that's something new. Uh, starting to find uh, drug par paraphernalia in homes. As inspectors, we're reaching up, touching, reaching up in the places we can't see, putting our hands in crawl spaces, attic spaces. You don't know what the homeowner uh, his habits are or what's stored. Maybe the homeowner doesn't know. Maybe there was something left from previous. So these are just the things that you have to do to protect yourself. Um, I've been in homes where, you know, there's uh, just a lot of stuff on the floor that you don't want to be walking through. Uh, whether they have animals that live in the home full time, there's just those scenarios. And, uh, and, I, and, and I have where I had to change my shoes change my clothes sometimes after leaving a home. So you wanna have sometimes that Tyvek suit because you do need it at times. Because uh, you don't wanna cross contaminate. Uh, there's also those other ones that are uh, bed bugs. You know, as an inspector, you walk into a home and you find out there's bed bugs and you, you sat on the couch, you, you know, to interview the person and then you, you cross-contaminate. You can contaminate your own home, your own vehicle. So uh, you learn when you do inspections to avoid contact in the home. And that's a hard thing when you know that there's bed bugs there is just to have that respect with that homeowner and say, I, uh, this is just policy, I'm following procedure, you know, this is what I need to do. So th that, that's always a hard one to uh, to explain okay so I don't know if there's anything else that people have there but a new thing that uh, is coming up is uh, tablets and iPads using that as a tool in inspection because it takes a long time to do an, ass an assessment for those who have been doing housing assessments to do a good quality assessment it takes time so we're starting to use uh, a tablet an iPad type system and I know there's other companies out there that have the software integrated into tablets where you can do an assessment and an inspection you know so that's somewhere I think we're, we're gonna go look into more further so that we can uh, cut down the report time from inspection to a finished report into the right uh, funder whether it be CME, CISC so that's just one one of the tools that is new for us um, but a lot of times, you know, the old notebook is sometimes still the best way in the camera. You know, I'm still kind of old school. I still do that. Chicken scratch notes. 
Uh, I can't, I'm the only one who can read it, so no one can do my reports. And uh, like I said, I'm the most wanted for CMHC. So when I started doing housing inspections, there is no one course that I know of or at the time that you could take to be a housing inspector or how to conduct housing assessments. There are areas that you can do. The National Building Code here in Ontario, they don't offer training. What they do offer is updates. That's why like, we bring Nejima from National Research Council. She presented this morning, those of you who sat in. She provides updates and they provide uh, new code changes to the National Building Code. But there's no training session like there is with the Ontario Building Code, which is available. Like how many people have ever taken Ontario Building Code course? Yeah. They're, they're, they're not easy. You have to study. You have to have a technical background helps, whether you're construction, uh, they give you years of experience if you've been working, say, 20 years building homes and then you want to go to be a building inspector, they give you credit based on your work experience or education. But generally, if you have a civil or architectural type background from a college or university, they allow you to take those courses. And you need a 70 to pass. And I think to be so-called get building code qualified, it's average between eight to 12 building code courses and they're one week long. And uh, yeah, it's a process. I got certified back in 2006 or seven when I got my designation. And I think uh, I've been hearing rumors that the tests are a lot harder now and they're diff structured differently. So if those of you that want to go out and test, make sure you study, review, and uh, yeah. And I just listed, uh, so once you become uh, building code certified in Ontario, you can belong to the Builders Association. That's the organization that helps you keep current, takes new training. Um, also, there's they offer through Humber College. There's CMHC training. There used to be a, a program, not, uh, it was like a nine-week program uh, in the 80s or 90s, where CMHC had a nine-week inspection course that they used to deliver. But uh, I guess it was good, so they canceled it. So, because <laughs> it, it went, uh, um, the only reason I, my, my father, my dad took it, and it went through a series of construction, which makes sense, right? It, it taught you from the foundation, from the site work all the way to the finishes, and it, it was geared to teaching you how to be an inspector and what to look for. I don't know if there's something around, but I don't know of. I don't know of one of a course that can be taken. I know it's fragmented. You can take different courses to be a certified inspector or to learn how to inspect. Uh, so I said that I was wet. So that's a separate course for wood stoves and wood heating appliances, whether pallet stoves, uh, certified wood stoves, uncertified wood stoves. So that course is uh, for, for level one. It's, I think, five or six days and there's three tests involved to be certified. Has anyone taken wet certified training here? No? Does anyone know all their wood stoves are in compliance in your community? You do? Yeah, it, the, the wood stove heating up in the north and even wherever you have wood heating, a lot of the times you can find a deficiency because a certified wood stove, you follow manufacturer's instructions, and then you uncertified, you follow the CSA standard, which is, a, what is it, 406-17 now, revision 17. But anyways, when you buy your home package, when you get your wood stove, follow the manufacturer's instructions. And the big thing that is always a deficiency is that the floor pads that they send are never big enough to meet the requirements of the code. Because the code, uh, the floor pad is not the manufacturer's responsibility of the wood stove and it's not the responsibility of the home supplier. So when you get that black metal thing, it's not big enough. 
you need usually two. And, and the sizes are never the right size. You can't just buy one big one. They don't make it. You can't buy the smaller one. So you end up with this massive black metal thing, unless you do a custom build. Because that's always a deficiency. Every time when I go around and do housing assessments, it doesn't have that 18 inch clearance from when the, the lip of the ash tray in the front of the wood stove, 18 inches out, it needs to be uh, a floor pad of non-combustible material. So, and then the other thing about wood stoves is that you, I always just recommend anytime you're doing a housing assessment or order a new material, order a double wall flue pipe and make sure it's certified. How many people do that? When you order your home package, are you getting a double wall certified flue pipe? Yeah? Because I, I didn't know, like uh, 10 years ago, there wasn't a certified double wall flue pipe. It was just a double wall flue pipe. But now as manufacturers have certified their, their equipment. So there's other things, there's HVAC, HAIR, and of course there's our First Nation Housing Conference, you can get training here. Uh, estimating, report writing, client relations, those are all skills that you need to develop as doing a housing assessments. They're, they're, you know, most education doesn't, is, there's nothing geared specific to doing housing inspections, it's kind of thrown on top, whether you're a health inspector, building inspector, that uh, report writing skills is a huge thing and just learning how to communicate what you see and the condition of the home and put it in a language that is understandable to the people who don't understand housing and to communicate that. And then also estimating. Uh, estimating is always different for each community and it's uh, the cost of a two by four to get it up north or to your community and by the time it install, it is installed, how much does that two by four cost? square foot costs, breaking down your, your, uh, your inspection and putting it by line item. And I have an example of the ones that we use and we'll get into that more. But to be a, like, like it takes time and commitment and training and dollars to become a housing inspector. Like there's uh, sewage, on-site sewage inspection. Uh, we haven't even talked about electrical, right? here in Ontario there's the electrical safety authority that's something else that is going to be changing especially for the communities in the Watanikania project where you've been your own independent power authority now when Hydro One takes over they're going to require an ESA inspection that wasn't a requirement before so these are some of the changes that are going to be coming when you get connected to the grid and then in the communities in the south where you deal with union gas you have to phone Union Gas for your connection or have a contractor that's certified. Because uh, as the inspector or when you're doing an assessment, when you do the assessment, it's your name on the line and it's the you that they come back on. So if you miss something, it's you. So when I, uh, I'll tell you, when I first graduated, I was going out and doing inspections. I think I was like, I don't know, 20, 20 years old, 19 years old. I'd walk around with a building code, eh? You know how big the building code is and I would be doing inspections. Because I didn't know, right? Builders, these uh, guys are all, you know, big beards. and Like, who is this kid telling us that we're doing it wrong, right? And I said, no, it says right here. They said, no, that's not how we build it. No, this says right here. So it is challenging. For those of you who are just starting out or those of you who are just getting into it, uh, carry the code around with you. So I know it's a, it's a pain in the ass because the thing weighs about 20 pounds, but it's, it's a good resource and it's a, a good tool to have when you're doing housing assessment, especially if you're given advice on the spot. That's another thing that uh, comes up is people want answers now and you, uh, if you don't know, say, I don't know, but I'll get back to you, right? with anything. If you don't know, say, I don't know, but I'll get back to you. Okay. So now we're going to plan. We're doing an assessment. 
and just here's some typical uh, data collection size of your house I always tell people measure your house right get the square footage so that you can do estimates uh, ask year of construction last renovation how many people live there these are the type of things that you want to do and, and of course you want to do the uh, all areas of the home you want to crawl in a crawl space you want to go in the attic right because that stuff will come back if you don't do those things nobody likes crawling around people know that if you're a good building inspector you'll get in the crawl space you'll crawl in there right uh, for me being 6'3 sometimes those little areas are tight but you got to go in there one foot crawl space dirt you know th those are the kind of things that need to uh, to happen this house here uh, as a community people are living there uh, it was by the front door the there was so much uh, moisture in the crawl space that it rotted out the floor literally fell down one day and it's still like that this was just uh, this past summer so people are still living in this house and uh, there's no floor in the front door so they have luckily they had a, a second door so that's their main en entry so these are the kind of things that you know why we want to shorten our timeline why we want to do an inspection report that will help community members and then uh, always follow the same routine don't get out of order don't let the homeowner drag you around look at this look at that do your inspection first whether you start at the foundation to the roof make sure that you follow the same steps kitchen bathroom living room bedrooms whatever that is follow that system and because for for remote communities or if you're traveling far to a community to do that one a house assessment and you didn't go in a crawl space or you missed something and then you don't have no photos of it no notes and then you do the inspection report and the renovation and then you find out all oh, the the crawl space had no insulation in it right and it does happen stuff like that does happen that components are missed um, yeah So I'll just show you an example of uh, an inspection report that we use. So it just says, uh, how, how many people use an inspection form when they're doing inspections? Is, do you have a form or is it notebook? Huh? Yeah. Huh? How many of you are using a tablet? That CRW something out of Winnipeg, I think? No? But anyways. What we want to do is work with the company and transfer some of this data into it. So we're asking like the type of services, the rooms, how many children, the age. And some of that information is so that we can turn this into a, a housing, a community housing plan. So that we know the age of the occupants. So that we know what people who are going to need their own home or people who are going to move out or need a senior's home so that we can uh, put that data together. And we say next year, we have 35 people who are gonna be turning 19, and we may need to build tiny homes, two bedroom homes, or we have elders that wanna move out and have their own home. Or we have large number of families. So those are the different things. Um, and uh, what else is there? Just more questions about the, the condition of the home, if you smell anything when you first walk in the home. How many people pay attention when they first walk into that home because your nose gets accustomed to the, that smell in the home, right? That, so when you first walk in, always pay attention to that smell, that musty smell, mold smell, you know. And then if you go over to the inspection, so we have, we have it broken down as to exterior, so you can comment on each thing. It's pretty detailed, and this is kind of what we want to... I know some uh, software companies, they have this kind of stuff already, but this is what we've been doing for the last year, is filling out this form. And we want to use Excel so that the data is transferable, so that once we pick a program or once we decide which one we're going to use, 
generally excel, that data can be transferred over into other programs. And when you export it, usually you can export most data into Excel. So you can see we have all the areas broken out by room, and we have a comment for each area. So it is tedious, and that's why pictures help, because if you were to write everything that's in here, you'd be in the homeowner's house for like two or three hours, right? Most times you only want to be in there an hour tops, so but you want to make sure that you at least capture everything, whether through pictures or notes. Okay, can you uh, go just go over to the photos? So then we have a spot for photos. We label them. Usually we take pictures of the two corners on the, each side. So when you're outside, so that you capture all four sides, right? Take picture of the front and the side, and then the back. That's usually our first two photos. And then from there, if there's any major deficiencies, we take a picture of that, and then we include deficiencies of the interior. I don't know. Unless it's a brand new house, you take pictures of good stuff, I guess, but generally when you're doing housing assessments and going around, it's for renovations or there's a renovation program coming up, so you want to capture those deficiencies. Um, ah, so then go over to the work description. So in this Excel sheet, uh, we, we have filled in uh, an average cost of what it's been costing in our communities for each item. And then the housing manager, we can make those changes with the community, but we just have it fillable. So every line item here matches up with the inspection report. So then we have broken it down into square foot cost or linear cost. It's all broken down so we can just punch in square meters, quantity. So that way at the bottom, and this is our, and uh, labor is included in this too. At the bottom, we have a total cost for our thing here. So then we have a summary sheet. So I think we're going to make this a separate uh, sheet because sometimes most funders or people who are approving stuff, they just want a summary of the cost. So that's how we're going to, that will be probably another, we're going to call it a summary sheet and have other data just showed up so that People don't have to read the whole technical report. Just give them the straight facts. So that's kind of what we're using right now. Uh, our communities, we inspected every home in one of our communities right now. So we're just in the final stages of putting our kind of final report together uh, of the demographics that I was talking about earlier. The age of people, overcrowding, the number of bedrooms, how many people live in that home. So that way that tool can be used for future planning. And I guess with a little more uh, feasibility study and stuff like that, you can call that like your community housing plan for the either five years or 10 years, whatever you want to project it out. So it takes a lot of time to even get all the houses inspected. Like, you know, we have in our, in our tribal council, I think we have about 1500 homes. And right now, our average report writing time to finish, plus including, is about five hours. That's, that's the average from inspection to final report, five hours per unit. So there's a lot of man hours to get that done. Is there any questions? I feel like I'm just spewing out stuff. And if you have any questions, we have a microphone here. If there's anything that you want to ask that I've been talking about, So there's uh, many ways that uh, over the years that I have uh, re received requests. Sometimes once you're known in the community as the building inspector, people start calling you directly. You have homeowners calling you. If that's the process you have in your community or in your tribal council, that's fine. But I would always recommend that you go through the proper channels of say, chief and council or the housing manager. You always want to have that one point of contact. If you're doing inspections, you want to have that sole chain of command because things will get messed up. Uh, you may miss an inspection date or the homeowner may think that you're going to come right away. There's always, uh, there's different stories once you start communicating with the homeowner, unless you have that relationship with that community. But I, I would encourage you guys to set up a chain of command so that when there is a request, it either goes to the housing department, and if it goes to chief and council, 
they, they shouldn't receive requests for, they should just pass it off to the housing manager. Uh, I'm always encouraging communities that you try to take politics out of housing, even though it's a very strong political issue. Housing is, people want to be involved, people want to see housing happen. So there's that need for leadership to be directly involved to, because they know that there's a need to build houses. But if you have a housing department and if you have a housing manager, go through that department, go through them as a building inspector or doing house assessments, follow the process. Don't just show up and go to a community's house because the misconception then that person may say, I'm getting my house inspected, that means I'm getting a renovation, right? Um, and you can see that there's a different requests from agencies. OFNTSC now has the contract for CMHC to do all the PCRs, uh, Section 95, RAP. So tribal councils now get the contract to do inspections for their communities. I think I haven't signed my new contract yet. And then housing managers, tribal councils, you get all kinds of requests from different people. But you want to make sure that you uh, go through your proper channels. And then once you decide, then you got to give notice to either the homeowner or the community. And we have used Facebook. So when we went out to the community and we're, we blitzed, we had five people doing housing assessments. And we updated by a, a community notice posted at the band office, community hall. And then we also used Facebook because everyone is on Facebook. And we just linked it through the community homepage. And then that was probably the best way that we found to make appointment dates. Then all of a sudden, you know, you got to put your information out there. But if you're the building inspector, maybe you can make one through, uh, say, your community housing department or through your company. Have a general Facebook page for contacting community members to make, because uh, we, doing the whole community, we had to make inspection uh, times and appointments for five people in 110 homes. So it took a little bit of coordination just to do that when you want to blitz a community to do housing inspections. And then be clear on the intent of your assessment. This is only for housing purposes only. It's only for data. We're trying to build our data, our demographics. We want to know where we stand with our houses. We want to know, because AFN, the government, are always asking us, What's your, what is your housing like? What is your data, right? And a lot of times, I think it's inaccurate because it's not done properly or it's done just by general knowledge of the community, but it's not based on an actual inspection report per community. Maybe there are some out there, communities that are doing it and, and great, but a lot of times when uh, governments are asking for this information, it's a tight timeline and it's unrealistic when they come out and uh, ask for inspections. Okay. So this, uh, this part of the, hey, hey, <laughs> contractors, eh? I ain't going to answer your call this spring. No, I know Dave. <laughs> so I always like this part of the, the process. You get to meet people. You get to meet the community. Um, after you have done your inspection, right, you do your housing assessment first, and then you can report back to what you have found and then they can also report to you the condition of the home. They live there. They know the creaks, they know the leaks, the squeaks, right? They're the ones that live in the home. Uh, and uh, just like when you go to a doctor and you tell them your conditions, they don't listen to you, listen to the homeowner. You know, if they say that there was a plum, uh, flash flood in the basement one time, maybe the sump pump didn't work, there is a history and there's a story to that home. And, it, and it's a good way to let them know. And you, you can explain here too why you're there, what the purpose is, and find out if there's something that you miss. And then one thing that I have done before is that sometimes the homeowner will say, you know, I think there's mold behind there. I can always smell mold. Or my kids sleep in the basement. And they, they say that it stinks or it smells like mold, right? But when you do a visual inspection, you, you, can't, you can't see that until you get those stories, right? 
So I, I have asked them and I have opened up a small hole or cut out a small piece of drywall to see the backside, but you gotta get permission and understand that you're not gonna fix it after, right? You're doing like a Mike Holmes inspection, you're gonna say everything is no good, no, tear it all out. I, I don't like how that guy perceives, but we, because we don't have the budget to do that. But those are the kind of stories that I like to hear from the homeowner is get those details and sometimes you need to do a little more detailed investigation. Like I have uh, inspected homes and you know it's more so in municipalities where there'll be a layer of bat insulation and then you lift it up and there's vermiculite underneath or you find out that the home uh, certain color type of drywall it's known to uh, contain asbestos or I have taken a piece of floor tile that it was built in the 70s and the homeowner we're planning a renovation and you find out that that material may contain asbestos so, and depending on because you know when you do uh, renovations in the community the guys don't all have all that protective equipment so if you suspect that a material may have asbestos you want to make sure you try to identify it during your assessment because you don't want the guys to go in there and be breathing that stuff in especially when it's being uh, airborne right so those are the things that I have come across. Uh, I have found asbestos in communities, more so in the floor tile. Uh, some paint issues, older homes, you have some of that, uh, even the mud had asbestos in it because it was used in everything in the 70s. It was a filler. It was uh, just a thing that was readily available and it was all in a lot of building products. Um, the other thing is when you're looking at the home and you're talking to the homeowner, sometimes I show them and I take this opportunity to show them how the HRV works because a lot of times I find an HRV that has never been plugged in, never turned on. So, and it's because the homeowner is scared or doesn't know or wasn't shown. So we open up the HRV, clean it sometimes if I have time and just show them because it's an important thing, right? A lot of times, building inspectors, you're a teacher also. You're telling the homeowner for the first time how the wood stove works, how HRV works. And I find myself explaining to a lot of people uh, a little bit of a building science, the importance of air ventilation. So when you're going out and doing these assessments, you know, if you have the time, just explain to the homeowner or make note of it to let the people know that this individual doesn't know how to operate their home. A lot of times uh, I find communities, the homes that I have inspected now 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the house is moldy. And you find out the HRV wasn't plugged in. Or you find out that there was a small plumbing leak that they never told. And now you have a $30,000 renovation where it could have been tightening up a, a plumbing fixture. So those are the kind of things that uh, you want to talk to the homeowner about, is to get on those things. Because I, I, I have seen homeowners where they say, yeah, there's been a plumbing leak here. I called the band 10 times and I told them about it. I said, well, how come you didn't get down and tighten it? I don't know. So now the cupboard's rotten, subfloor's rotten. Now you need 20 grand where you could have just tightened that fixture. It happens. I've seen it many times. Okay. So there's a few things when you do your housing assessment that happens is one thing that is a big thing and I, and I always try to make the community aware of is when you find health and safety items. You as a building inspector or if you're conducting them, it's just kind of due diligence. It's kind of things when you see in a situation that's unsafe, just like in childcare, you have due diligence to report. So when you're doing a home inspection and you find out that there is a deficiency and there is no smoke alarms, how many smoke alarms in a house? Every room and every living, every, yeah, no, every floor, right? So when you're doing an inspection in an existing home and there isn't no smoke alarms in every bedroom, what does your new report say? No, 
is it required? The, the new inspection, or I mean the new smoke alarms per bedroom when you're doing an existing home inspection. So the, the straight answer is no. In First Nations, unless a community has adopted certain bylaws or BCRs that identify that when a home is to be renovated or um, there isn't a solid thing that says you have to or you shall. Uh, so as your building inspection report, you don't have that authority. It's the leadership or chief and council that has jurisdiction in their community unless they have written a BCR to give you jurisdiction. So even though I act like my building inspection report has weight, it does in a sense in regards there's a government program and you can withhold funds. But if the band or somebody is building their own home, if they go ahead and build it, and besides me making noise about it, legally there's nothing that can stop them, right? But there's always funders involved or a bank involved. So you ha the inspector has ways of making something happen. But a lot of times, things get ignored, I guess. But you as an individual, when you find a health and safety item and identify it, you have the due diligence to report that to the authorities, which is sometimes I make sure that my report ends up in chief and council's hand or the counselor that has that portfolio for housing, right? And, and, and I know, uh, especially in Health Canada, a lot of their letters are addressed to Chief and Council, right? The homeowner may be CC'd or not, or the Housing Department, but it's usually generally to Chief and Council. And it's the same thing with us when we do our inspections. Most times, depending on the, if the First Nation and the relationship, but usually it goes to the Housing Department and if there is an issue that needs to be identified, I ask them to send it to Chief and Council or I CC them. Um, so ramps, hand railing, blocked windows, especially in a home where the larger homes where it's means of egress. Uh, a lot of times in communities, you'll see uh, insulation and plywood over a broken window. And that's... Uh, it may not be a means of egress issue, but I always try to make sure that those windows get replaced because that may be their only means of escape in the event of a fire. I, I'm sure Mo and uh, talked about it earlier in this presentation. And then the second door, you know, a lot of communities or people always say, hey, my house only has one door. My, uh, my house doesn't meet code. Well, in, uh, in the National Building Code or the Ontario Building Code, one entry door meets code. But best practice, you should have a second door or a patio door or a window. How many people have a fire escape plan for their own home? That's good. Your kids did it, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I've seen a uh, uh, few homes over the years. You, you'll see a little kid's drawing of their home, my bedroom, mom and dad's. That's good. You want that safety. You should practice them. Practice your fire escape plan. Uh, plumbing, I put plumbing there because uh, health and safety, I have been in homes where there is sewage either in the crawl space or in the basement and occupants have blocked off, uh, screwed the door shut or whatever and there's just raw sewage in the house. And I've seen it right to the underside of floor joists. So those kind of things you have the due diligence to report whether or not you think that people are going to listen or not or it's going to be taken seriously you have to report it you have to report issues that you see and sometimes you have to the band may have to come up with funds to address that issue especially if it's a fire issue you know there 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 have been in the communities up north there have been a lot of fire issues electrical issues and these are the kind of things that we're trying to capture you don't want something, a strategy on your hands where you've been there. There may be legal action. Um, just to scare you guys. Uh, scope of work and cost. In our inspection reports, I always try to leave a detailed description of the repairs. Because sometimes that, that, that helps the homeowner or, I mean, the housing manager or your lead crew guy. And sometimes these things turn into contracts with the estimate wiped out. 
or it becomes a scope of work for the community workers so that they know they got to change the electrical outlet in bedroom two or they got to replace the broken window downstairs so that it is a quick tool for them to a housing manager to issue a contract or issue to their workers so the more detailed you can provide in your assessment the less you have to do work down the road because if you have a vague scope of work they're going to be calling you what do you mean here we don't know how to change the wood stove we don't know what type of flooring you wanted in here so those are the kind of details that you get into so that someone can use your report uh, i always try to go be class c class d estimate within 20 percent I know a lot of people get nervous about putting an estimate in there because they said, well, that's going to be the cost. No, it's an estimate. And you tell the housing manager, this is an estimate. I didn't measure every square foot. I didn't measure the exact size of the windows, but I know the average cost. This is the average cost to replace all five windows in a home, six, seven grand. Right? You might be out a little bit here and there, but tell them that. Tell them your estimate is within 20%. Um, and when you do that scope of work and that detail, when you do a wrap inspection, when you're doing any kind of inspection report, the funders and the people who review those, they need that scope of work anyways. So with a few modifications, you can transfer that data into any form. That's why you're, so you're not duplicating work. You're not rewriting a whole new report for any funder out there or any application process. Um, Another thing here, a classification system. One thing in our report, I don't know if it was there, but we're trying to classify our homes and give them a rating from zero to 10. So zero being should be replaced, 10 being it's brand new. Because that also will help people who are planning and housing managers when they're identifying, when they get a million dollars, say, to renovate homes, they have some solid data to pick which homes get it rather than the old squeaky wheel gets the money it's going to the right house because we all have the people in the community that phone every day my tap is leaking my house is moldy my house is this but meanwhile next door like that picture earlier their house floor their floor fell through and they never called the band because there are people that don't want to be a nuisance or don't want to complain and there are people that call every day because their doorknob is broken so if when you have a rating system or a classification system, it gives you that extra tool or the people who are making the decisions so that it takes out the guessing game and it takes out favoritism, takes out the same old guy gets the renovations all the time because he's related to the chief or they're, they're on council so they get all the renovations. These are the, that's why you have to do a proper inspection, assessment, condition, and it's straight data. It's not about who it is, it's just about the house and the occupants that live there. That's the kind of housing assessment that I, I try to make, right? And, and then even, I don't know, maybe go as far as not having the name on the house when, when it comes time to evaluate and assess the value of the home repairs for each of them. The other thing, if, I don't know if I mentioned it, that whole uh, scope of work and that cost, so earlier this morning, I said it cost between 350 to 400,000 to build a home up north, right? Down south, maybe it's around 300,000, depending on the size and your finishes. But it, there's always a rule of like, I tell them like, if you only have 100,000, if you have a 300, $400,000 home and it needs $100,000 of repair, more than likely you, need, you still need that house because there's people living in it or people can move into that house so it's always hard people always ask me when do you not renovate a house when is it deteriorated far enough that you should just write it off and, and it's different for every community because first of all there's probably people living in there so as a building inspector when you if you condemn that home be prepared to give them more support to find a solution to put new people in there that's that's my approach um, I think I might have condemned a few homes in my, in, in my time, three or four. But when you condemn a, condemn a home and if there's people living in there, 
then action is definitely required. So make sure when you're doing your assessment, you evaluate it properly and you come up with an estimate of repair and then you find out what's the replacement cost and then you make your assessment together. And it's, not always, it's never always going to be the same. It might be 60% of the construction value, 80%, 90%, who knows. But it's a process. And that's why is building uh, inspectors and people who are doing assessments, you need to follow through when you do your assessment. You can't drop the ball. Do follow-up calls. Find out if they are going to renovate that house. And just uh, be with them. And of course, when there's uh, construction happening to the, your assessment, I encourage you to be a part of it, uh, the renovation and make sure that the, the new repairs meet code. Okay. How am I for time? I'm not even looking. What time are we supposed to be done? All right. We're done. No. Okay, so completed house assessments. Uh, just here's another example of flooring conditions in the community. I'm sure a lot of you have these types of things in your community. Um, but once your house assessment is completed, you've done all the work, five hours of work, so your inspection report is ready for renovations. Uh, it's ready to be used as a planning tool. Uh, it could be included into a form part of your housing community plan. And then the other thing you should put on there, of course, is the date. And then you should decide if you're going to reinspect once a year, every two years, right? Because you got to go back, the condition will change. And uh, communities, like I tell communities that are around the 300 homes per community, the housing ins uh, manager, if they are doing the house assessments, is they should try to do one every two days to take the time and go do your, even if they're taking, say if it's from a travel council or a building inspector, take your report and just even hand right on it if it's the same or conditions, right? Because sometimes in the community you may not have time or the capability or, or the experience or the understanding, but use an existing inspection report and just update it and phone your building inspector, say, this house has changed drastically, come and re-inspect. Uh, so your application or your renovation is uh, funding ready and then it also provides uh, leadership and the government with the correct data when you when you go through the process. Um, yeah. So what would this be? I know this flooring looks bad here, but is that a zero as replacement? Is it poor? Do you put new flooring in? Do you put new flooring? And then the other thing I, I tell people is, so say you only have $10,000, you have a budget, but you have windows that are cracked, or you have smoke alarms, or you need a ramp, or you need other repairs that are, have a greater concern for the house. So I have done reports in renovated homes where I have left flooring conditions like this because there's been other more important conditions in the home. And those are hard choices to make uh, when you come to time to renovate because people always want new windows, new doors, new roof, right? Those are the things that are common. But a lot of times I find homes that the foundation is not addressed, the crawl space is moldy, there's not proper ventilation installed. But the house looks nice because we did the flooring and the windows. Um, we renovated a house in a community and the homeowner, we, I was talking to the homeowner and she said, it always smells in my house. It's been renovated, the floor has been re done numerous times. And I said, well, what's going on? She says, well, I tell them that I live in the, and water comes through every spring, every time it rains hard, it comes through. But she says, they didn't listen to me. So I went, and didn't, went in the crawl space. Yeah, and it was moldy. There was no ground cover, no insulation. And it was about, 12 inches of space so then when we started investigating and we went into the crawl space there were seven layers of tongue and groove in the floor so the community instead of addressing the crawl space issue 
they just added another layer of flooring on top of the existing. No, I'm not kidding. There's seven layers of flooring. The floor was eight inches thick. And then so, but the, the rest of the house was fine. The electrical, roof, everything was done. So we lifted the house. We made a report that we lifted the house, built a proper foundation, drainage, took out the six layers of flooring and put it back together. So those are the kind of things when, you know, that story of, that was an example of the homeowner was telling people, my, there's something more with my house. And the community and the workers, they weren't listening. So there, there are switches, situations like that. Now, seven layers of flooring, probably about $15,000 a pop, times seven, and it still didn't address the house. I was in a community, they were fixing up, they were replacing all the drywall in the basement insulation vapor barrier, and the guys were telling me, oh, this is our third time doing this in 10 years. I said, well, what are you doing? Well, it's moldy. So I went out, I said, well, let's go outside. So the whole house, it had a negative slope right around the house. It had nice grass, nice grass around the house, but it was still sloped towards the house. I said, why don't you guys either reshape the house or excavate, put some blue skin around there, and then you don't have to replace the drywall. So what do they do? They put blue skin on, they re-sloped it. So when you're doing a housing assessment, you have to learn what to look for and look for the cause and not address a band-aid issue. You don't want to just go and change that one window to keep that person quiet when that window is always breaking or that door is always breaking. It may be the house is shifting. There, there may be many factors. So always take the time to investigate and find out what's going on with that home, especially if you've been renovating a house for the same issue every five or six years. Um, so one of the things like uh, this is going to be like in, in our uh, First Nation community uh, this year we're going to start to try to develop uh, some basic housing assessment uh, seminars courses we're not sure how we're going to roll them out but we're going to start to have some training programs so that either it's going to be we're going to try web based but we might try to attach it to the housing conference and try to have, uh, see if we can help and work with our funders to get housing assessment training set up. Uh, I, I did it years ago in, in a community where it was a, a week long course and it was like a day of in class going through a foundation and then a day in the field, day in class. And it went well. I think we, uh, I think I did about 10 people and then we went out in the community and then we inspected housing in the community and it was, it was, it was great. The guys loved it. They, they felt that they were contributing towards better housing in their community. So those are the kind of things that we would like to start to develop in our uh, First Nation community and have that uh, for people to sign up and stuff like that. So keep, keep looking at that website as we develop it. That's something that, uh, probably going to be me developing it, but anyways, there you go. So I don't know if there's any questions. I know I just talked a lot. I don't know if I covered anything or if it's all boring, but uh, I'd encourage you to uh, try to get some training in housing assessments, uh, try to get some building code training because uh, it takes a lot to understand a house and building science. Oh. So, Yes, the knowledge that, that I tell people, if you have mold, let's plan to get it out and let's plan to renovate it. If you want to spend a few thousand dollars to get it tested, that's fine, but it doesn't leave a good feeling with the homeowner if it's not blastomycosis, right? Is that what you mean? The, the mold, the black mold? Like, how do you think, uh, or, or the stuff in the ground? Am I talking yeah, about? Oh, the ground? Okay, so that in, in the Kenora area, right? Yeah. So there, there are vapor barriers now, if you're talking about the house and crawl spaces that don't have uh, ground cover, there are vapor barriers now that are thicker 
and some of them even claim that they're a radon type of uh, vapor barrier that they stop the passage of radon through. So I would encourage that those properties of those uh, vapor barriers would still in, uh, inhibit the passage of blastomycosis into the home, into the crawl space. But they are a little bit more. They're probably about four, four times the cost of your typical uh, six mil poly. And if you can't that, there's, a, there's 10 mil poly now that has a, a higher resistance to the passage of gases through. So I would, in uh, the houses I inspect now, we use a, the stucco or we use a radon type now for vapor barrier. Because I mean, the cost difference now to go into a radon type of vapor barrier, it is a code requirement now. And it's going to be the National Building Code, I think, in the next uh, one. I'm not sure if Najima talked about it, but I've been telling communities now we have to do something for radon, and that would also cover blasto. Yeah. Hi. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Closer. Closer? There you go. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, as a building inspector, have you ever assisted a nation with developing a policy around um, best practice construction standards for renos and new home construction? So, um, at a small scale, I have worked with housing, uh, housing departments and we kind of develop a set of drawings uh, when we build on them each year. Uh, so to keep those construction details, and it's working with your drafting company or working with your people who do your drawings. And I try to encourage communities not just to go with the building supplier drawings, because I haven't found too many that meet code, especially when you get into the Ontario Building Code, when you have to pick your efficiency of your furnace and your HRV and then you pick the right package, a lot of times that's SB12. That's not correctly spelled out in your drawings. But yeah, I, I have helped communities. Usually we start out, what do you build? What are you comfortable with? Where do you want to go? What type of quality of home do you want to achieve? Are you looking to achieve a certain uh, R value, uh, reduce energy cost, or do you want to just build more structural, stable homes, right? Because the National Building Code is a minimum standard, but if you build to the National Building Code, that is a good start. The new Building Code is the Intergard 80. So if you're building to the National Building Code, that's good. That's a good starting point. But it's a minimum, but you can always exceed it. You can always add insulation. You can always add better quality windows, flooring, but the cost goes up. But if that's the goal of your community, you don't want to renovate homes every five years, 10 years. Yeah. Any more questions? Have you ever en encountered any inspections where hoarding was so bad that you couldn't complete it at all? <laughs> I've been in the one house where I, uh, I had to leave because I, I, uh, I had to throw up. So, yeah. Uh, it, and uh, the, the whole, when you find situations like that, you have to handle it with care. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a counselor or anything, but usually there, there, there are more going on with the occupant. And usually you have to involve. This one was vacant where the tenant moved out. That, yeah. that was after the fact. Yeah. And usually, depending on your own bylaws and what you have in your community or your practice of how you deal with vacant homes and abandoned homes, uh, generally I try to tell communities, if someone does abandon it, issue them a letter telling them that you have abandoned your home. And as leadership, we're moving forward and we're going to vacate your belongings and they're going to be stored at a cer certain place or they're going to be removed to the garbage if they, if they deem that they're un unusable. And again, that, those are hard situations. But uh, I tell communities, if somebody's on a vacation or somebody has abandoned their home, to utilize that home because there are ho housing shortages in most communities. Well, oh, okay, one more. 
Hi, I'm the housing manager at Nigger Goose Manor Canning. Uh, one of my duties last year was to complete all the housing inspections. The inspection template sheet that I have is very basic, and I was wondering if you had copies or, yeah. or suggestions for other templates or... I, I have a few different types of templates. The one that I showed is kind of very detailed. Um, I can share that with you and other examples that I have. Just my emails there. Send me an email and I'll reply to you in six months. No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>